Thank you everyone for coming uh, and welcome to the April session of our Tory Talks lecture series. Uh, my name is Jordan Hoffman. I'm the uh, programming chair for Tory and I'm nice, it's very nice to have you all here. Shortly, I'm gonna turn this over to, uh, to our speaker for today, Dr. Juan Carlos uh, Pinagos, just to give a little bit of an introduction for him. Um, Juan got his, uh, his bachelor's and master's degrees from the National University of Columbia at Medellin and also the uh, University of Missouri at St. Louis uh, before getting his, his doctorate very recently at Yale University at 2020. Um, so he's now a, a postdoctoral associate uh, jointly at the Yale School for the Environment and also at the New York Botanical Garden. Uh, and so today he's going to speak to us about his research on the ecology and evolution of species in the Okotea complex. So please take it away, Juan. So thank you. Thank you, Jordan, for the introduction. And thank you for the inviting me. Let me share the screen. So I hope uh, I am on mute and people can see my screen. Um, so Again, thank you. It's a pleasure to be speaking here at the Tobey Botanical Society. This is a really nice way to present my work in our AC. Uh, a family that I've been kind of introduced in a random way. So uh, right after I finished my undergrad uh, in the Universidad Nacional de Colombia in Medellin, the physics department uh, contacted me. Uh, because they needed someone who identified some uh, laudaces. Uh, I was in the, I am in the, I am a forester. So uh, no, a forester called me and said, uh, do you want to work with laudaces? And of course I say, no, you know, who want to work with this family? You know, it's too difficult. And then he said, uh, are you sure? Are you gonna wait for something easy to work with? And then uh, here I am, uh, 15, 20 years later, uh, talking about Laudacy and explaining to people why Laudacy is still uh, so difficult. So at the end of this talk, I hope I can at least uh, show some strengths and limitations for why we cannot generate a solid and a clear taxonomy Laudacy and how ecological and evolutionary and systematic studies can provide information to overcome those limitations, this beautiful and amazing family. So let's start talking about Laudacy. Um, so first, what are Laudacy? So Laudacy is a pantropical family. That means that it's uh, present in all the tropics around the world. It contains around 3,000 species in 50 genera. So one of the few economical species that we know, that we use, are familiar with them every day, is the bay leaf, uh, camphor and cinnamon. And one sp uh, special species is the avocado, uh, who most of the people love now. Uh, in the United States, we have 13 species and nine uh, genera. Uh, here in the East Coast, with we have these two species, Sassafras and Mindera and Soy. You can just walk here in the botanical garden, then you will see them. And in the West Coast, we have this species that is endemic for the, uh, the cloud forest, the same forest and the redwood grows, and it's Umbellularia californica, really interesting species. Um, let's fix something here. Then, so recently, uh, we work in this molecular phylogeny. Uh, we were able to get the relationship, a well supported relationship for 150 neotropical species. Uh, they showed that uh, only a few genera were monophyletic within this group, within this group. Uh, and having trouble with this. And then let me explain you what monophyletic means for the ones that are not familiar with this. So monophyletic is when we compare a group to the uh, linear uh, system. So a family, genus, even species, or any of those uh, hierarchical categories. And we see in the phylogeny that is based on DNA, so kind of blood related, related uh, 
structure, if they agree, they are called monophyletic. But in some cases, the taxonomical groups that we uh, created, in this case, genera, uh, they can include the species that are not blood related. In this case, when we see here D, or we can, uh, we can forget to include some because they have some kind of morphological differences. So this is kind of in the statistic where we have error type, type one and type two. So monophyletic is the idea when a group is all the individuals are blood related, so they share the same ancestor, you know, but we can make mistakes as a taxonomy and include species that are not, or we can exclude the species that they should be. And that's kind of the main, uh, the main problem that we have in nowadays in trying to make this taxonomy agree with this taxonomy. And that's what I'm gonna uh, emphasize during this talk. So, when in the nowadays, uh, we define this group called supracotea. Uh, and based on this phylogeny, this relationship, you know, allowed to define the supracotea and contain an uh, informal group called uh, Ocotea complex. For years, we used this name, but it was an informal name. It didn't mean anything, just that Ocotea is not easy. So we move ahead and we, we name this clade uh, as supracotea. So from now on, we will refer our supracotea. And then uh, at the end of this talk, you will understand why we have to put the name there. So who are supracotea? Supracotea include or contains about 950 species in 17 genera. This, this clade uh, includes Ocotea. And if there's, there's genus with more species, or the species rich genus in the Neotropics. These are uh, the clade, the 950 species are mostly distributed in the tropics, in the neotropics, Central America and the Caribbean, and in South America. But we have some species like Umbellilaria, the species that I mentioned before, is part of this clade. Some species in West Africa, and species in Madagascar and the Comodoro Island. But again, the center of uh, diversity is uh, in the neotropics. Supracotea contains uh, most, uh, mostly trees and sometimes sub canopy trees. Uh, really, really can be tall up to 50 meters in some forests. And few, uh, few species are kind of shrubs, but they are uh, indeed uh, small trees. What is interesting is the flowers. Everything is interesting in nowadays, but the flowers are really, really nice. So. Flowers are trimerous. What that means is like a, they have, a, they are in multiple of three. So you have three or six for each part, three, six, nine uh, of each of the organs. Here, the, for instance, the tipples, we have six tipples most of the time, and we have uh, three, six, or nine stamens. Something unique, almost unique in Laudacy, or really distinctive, is the way how they, uh, how they uh, display the pollen. So this is the pollen here. And then now they see how these antlers and they open, they have these flaps that open up. They open up only once. They never close back and open uh, again. And that happens when the antler is already uh, mature. So they open up and then the pollen is attached to this flap. Is that's what we can see here, you know? And when that thing, when that uh, pollen uh, is uh, displayed, these glands over here, you can see the glands that are in the base of the stamens. They release this uh, kind of oils or nectar or smell. Sometimes you can even smell it from the ground and then attract the uh, insects, small insects, uh, bees, most of the time some flies. Uh, we don't know exactly, but we know that they are not big uh, uh, insects or big animals or no bats. Everything that is small, those flowers are really tiny. And then that's how they get the pollen in the body when they come and collect uh, nectar or oil from these glands. We get fruits that are uh, always with one seed, like the avocado. You know, avocado, one seed, everyone in the family has only one seed. They have droops, they have droops. And in the supracotea uh, clade, uh, 
fruits are always subtended by this uh, couple. The couple is uh, is uh, when the the uh, receptacle for the flower you know, after fertilization uh, get uh, as swollen. Can be fleshy, can be woolly, can be almost absent. But the function, like we see these two image, is to create contrast between red, uh, red and black or green and black. And that contrast is for frugivores, for birds to spot the, uh, the fruits on the tree. So it's a mechanism to attract uh, uh, dispersants. Within the Ocotea complex or the supra Ocotea clade, we have uh, the limit genera based on three main characters. One is the number of statements, nine, six, or three. The number of anterlocules, so it's, it's flapped and they open up. It's, you have two or you have four. And the uh, organization of these flaps matters or the uh, locules. Sometimes they are in two rows. Sometimes they can be in a notch. Or sometimes they can be pushed up to the top of the anther, you know, and breeding systems. When we have hermaphroditic, hermaphroditic when you have male and female in the same flower, so they produce pollen and ovules. Dicey, when uh, male and female flowers are in different trees, completely different trees. And an interesting system that is gynodiacy, when you have some individuals that are hermaphroditic, and some individuals are female. So you don't get males in this uh, breeding system. And we are gonna talk about uh, this system in detail uh, later on. So like I said before, Laura, it's quite complicated, uh, has this bad, bad, uh, bad stigma that it's a taxonomical nightmare, something that I share in some degree. And then what I have done is uh, I use supra cotea or this old ocotea complex as an integrated approach to provide uh, data that also contributes to taxonomy, studying the ecology, the evolution, and the systematic of these species. Then with that, I kind of integrate all of this to get uh, data for working in this taxonomy. So we're gonna dig a little bit into the ecology. So, we're going to talk about the ecology of Gainolaisi, the Gainolaisi uh, Ocotea of Longa. But before, let me explain what, uh, what the problem is. So we have floral dimorphism in Ocotea. So we have uh, a lot of species that are dicey, you know, uh, men in one plant and female in one plant. And that was the role. So when early botanists describe the species, you know, this is a now we know that Gainodaisi that was described as daisy, based on having a female flower. So you get a female flower, the counterpart will be a male flower. They didn't, or they were not aware of the uh, sexual diversity that we have in breeding systems, like how we have been doing in society later on. And then, then they did the easy thing. They said, you have female flowers, so the other tree has to be a uh, male. However, when they, start, when they start finding these male trees, they noticed that they were kind of different. And then they describing, oh, they are male, but they have a swollen pistil. Remember, the pistil is the female part. So they acknowledged that the flower didn't look completely male, but they didn't acknowledge that flowers could be hermaphroditic at that time uh, for two main reasons. One, they were using most of the time dry collections. So it's really difficult to tell if a pistil is fertile or not, based on the dry collection. But however, in 1986, Dr. James Rower in Hamburg University in Germany, he started finding male in, in botanical collection, branches with male flowers, or what we call male, and fruits. So that called his attention and say, like, uh, maybe those are not male flowers. However, again, looking at her body in a specimen, he couldn't say anything else. So taking advantage of that, we look at all the possible species that were described as daisy with a swollen pistil. And then we found a hotel of longa. The species are distributed from Mexico to uh, Paraguay. It's, uh, it's really common in, in lowlands. It's a big tree, can be up to 45 meters. 
And we found this population in this island called Barro Colorado. Barro Colorado is an island in the middle of the Panama Canal. Uh, it's the result of when they flood the river to connect uh, the uh, two oceans. That was the top of the hill of a mountain and then remained above the, the, the water. So for a hundred years, this island had been untouched, chemically untouched, and then it's a biological station now. In this biological station, they have a 50 hectare plot. That means a thousand meters by uh, 500 meters. And in those 50 hectares, they know every single individual that is uh, bigger than one centimeter in DVH. And every five years, they go on census. They know who died. They know who entered in the census. And they know how much everything, uh, every individual grows. And in that plot, they have around 300 individuals of Ocotea Oblonga. So having that data, having that population, I didn't have to go and look for laureates in these big trees. So I took advantage of that. And from, from 2016 to 2019, I visit every single individual twice a year. And I collect information about uh, sex. You know, only 65 of them were reproductive. And I collect information about fruit. And with that information, so I asked three main questions. So first is Ocotea Oblonga truly gynodaisy or it's a, a daisy? Uh, I also look for flowering sex ratio, like a male and female uh, difference. Uh, I also look for the cause of difference, uh, for the differential cause of reproduction. So let's say that females invest more energy than males, and then you will see that in, in the growth, uh, in difference in growth. So first of all, yes, indeed, the female flowers produce fruits and they have maphroditic produce fruit and then voila, we have gynodaisy in laudaisy. And then we also connect that when species that have this swollen pistil, they are more likely to be gynodaisy. And we found some floral dimorphism. So here in the right, the screen, we have a hermaphroditic flowers and they tend to be larger than the female in the left. But the female had this, the stigma is larger. So the stigma is the, the top of the piston when the pollen uh, is deposited. So the pollen gets there and germinates and fertilize the ovule that is in the bottom of the piston. So having a larger stigma here in the female, look how small it is in the hermaphroditic, that's supposed to give them an, a, a reproductive advantage. They have like an second like helipad. You know, it's bigger than the helipad, so you will get more pollen. However, when you look at the population, you have more hermaphroditic trees than females. So you get four hermaphroditic for each female. So you get more hermaphroditic in the population. So when we look at the number of fruits, we found that indeed females produce more fruits in average than the hermaphroditic, with the largest uh, number is uh, around 1,600 fruits in only one uh, season versus 200 uh, for hermaphroditic. But when you look at the fruit mass and the fruit seeds, there are no differences between sexes. So female and hermaphroditic invest more or less the same in fruits and seeds. And when we compare growth rates, so how they grow between different uh, senses, we found that hermaphroditic and female and the non reproductive, they didn't have any difference. So they grow technically the same, the same rate. Even when we include in the models, when we include how many fruit they produce, there are no differences. So it is really unlikely that there is, there is a cost of reproduction or we cannot see that in growth and, uh, and in the investment in fruit. So uh, for conclusion on this part, we can say that of course, how long is going on easy. Something interesting is an in the four years that we will look in trees, they have different ages because it's a natural population. Any of the trees change uh, the sex or they never have both uh, 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 flowers, both sexes. And the population is hermaphroditic uh, bias and there's no differences in resources allocation. So now I start combining a little bit ecology with evolution. And then I start looking at fruit shape in Sucrocotea and looking if there is ecologically or phylogenetically constrained. This is a really, this is a beautiful project because this is, this is a pandemic project. And then starting with this, 
1993, uh, Dr. Susan Mason and uh, Dr. Uh, Will Wright, uh, Will Wright. I think that's the first time that the name sounds right when it's pronounced. Okay, forget about that part. <laughs> so it's Will Wright. So uh, they found that in Costa Rica, the species of Laurasi, when they the fruit are larger, they tend to be elongated. That's what this uh, graph means. That means that increments in length are bigger than increments in diameter. They connected that result with this hypothesis that, like I said before, nowadays it tend to be dispersed by birds. So having elongated fruit allowed the birds to ingest the fruit uh, easily, that they were round and big. So the hypothesis is, yeah, you, you get elongated so you can be eaten and dispersed easily. But that only uh, but they only look at the species in Costa Rica. So the, during the pandemic, we decided to expand this to Suprocotea and see if all the species around the distribution range also have this allometric elongated fruits. And also we look in those in the shape, these elongated fruits are phylogenetically conserved or they are constrained by ecology. When I say this is a pandemic project it's because uh, we use uh, secondary information. So we got a, a collection from the herbarium. Uh, we scan, I, we know I didn't. People help me and I really appreciate it. I have to acknowledge the effort of everyone here in the herbarium. And we scan all the uh, collection with fruits in, in this supracotea. And we also collect information from the literature. So we gather information for uh, fruit length and fruit width for about 460 species. 110 of those are including the phylogeny. And for 1,500, around 1,500 collections with a precise uh, location, we also were able to uh, obtain climatic information. So what we did is we just run some linear models, uh, just uh, regressions, and we found that indeed, uh, fruit are allometrically elongated in nowadays. However, the slope is not as steep as in the paper in Susan and uh, 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 Susan Mason and uh, Will Wright. Here we have the distribution range in sizes. Uh, something interesting that like can easy, like to mess up with data. The larger fruit is right here in the line of isometric. Uh, isometric means that they're round. They're Round. So increments in length are equal to the increments in diameter. So the larger fruit is round, but uh, there is a, a trend that fruit tend to be elongated. So, but we were also wondering if uh, they are phylogenetically constrained. That means that species that are related, like a kind of blood related, they have the same shape. Or if species that are related, they have different shapes. So we use we did also phylogenetic linear models. In phylogenetic linear models, what we do is instead of being uh, considered every species at random, we use information for the phylogeny. So we use distance for the phylogeny. We create this uh, matrix and we include that matrix into the model. So species are not uh, random in this, uh, in this analysis. And what we found is the same uh, pattern to tend to be elongated. In, in nowadays, larger fruit tend to be elongated. And then we have this parameter called lambda. It's a very interesting parameter that when it's the range between zero and one. When lambda is zero, that means that phylogeny, so relatedness doesn't matter. So every species is doing it by its own. Or when lambda is equal to one, uh, that means that uh, the character is completely uh, derived. Or, phylogenetically constrained. That means some related species are more likely to have the same shape. So between zero and one, and of course, Laurency is 0.5. Like everything in Laurency has to be kind of tricky. However, what that means is, or the way how I interpret this result is, yeah, that's some effect of phylogeny. phylogeny. However, it's not completely uh, dictated by phylogeny. And then in this slide, we can see that. So this is the shape. So I divide length by diameter as a proxy of shape. 
And then what we see here is the phylogeny uh, tips in blue is uh, correspond to elongated fruits and tips in red uh, correspond to uh, round fruits. So we see that round fruits and elongated fruit occurs all over the phylogeny. And it's still some related species tend to have the same, uh, the same shape or tend to be similar in shape the fact that it occurs that many times is what is giving us this alpha, this lambda of 0.5. So phylogeny matters, but not completely. So what we did is like we look at the uh, environmental variables, precipitation, temperature, and elevation. And what we found is that only uh, temperature is positive, a uh, significant uh, weight uh, change. In this case, what that means, you get round fruits in cooler uh, ecosystem and elongated fruit in warmer ecosystem. However, length and diameter, they can have correlation, but those correlations are not significant. This is a, a work in progress. So I hope I can include more information, more variable, more samples. But so far we can conclude that fruit shapes, it's allometric, allometric in supracontea with some effect of phylogenetic relatedness that contributes to allometry. And and elongated fruits are more likely to occur in warming ecosystems. Then let's focus now in evolution. So for this, uh, this study, what I did is uh, we studied the character evolution of the three main, uh, the three main uh, taxonomic characters. And we look how Morphological characters contributes to this taxonomical nightmare. It sounds dramatic, but it's not that dramatic, but it's a nightmare. Sometimes you have nine, nine, nice nightmares. Um, so what we did, we use the same phylogeny, well-supported phylogeny from that sequence. And we uh, look at three, th these three characters, the number of statements, the number of locules, and breeding systems. And what we asked was, uh, if floral characters are useful to the limit monophyletic genera. Remember, monophyletic means that all the species included in one in, in a specific genus uh, correspond to the uh, to one clade. So they are uh, blood-related species. For that, we did an ancestral state reconstruction. And what is an ancestral state reconstruction? So let me walk you through this uh, plot here. So in each in this case, each tip corresponds to one species. And here we have present, present time. And in this direction, going deeper, you get time as well. So this event here, this dichotomy here, is way older than this one, and so and so. So this is the present time, and this is the, uh, you know, before the present. Here we have uh, the characters, uh, a score for the species today, and then this is a, a, the most likely scenario that the ancestors should have. So it's like we were thinking about uh, if looking at your eye color, we can infer your grandfather's uh, or your grandparents' uh, eye color. That's technically what we were doing here without looking at your grandparents. Um, so in this case, we are looking at the ancestor reconstruction for the number of statements. And what we found is like and they originated from a really likely uh, a scenario when uh, you have nine statements, nine statements here in, in the empty circles. And they originated to three independently and six independently, multiple times. So they didn't went from nine, six, three. No, they were nine to six and nine to three. Really interesting result. And why is interesting? Because we use a statement, number of statements to the limits of the genera. For instance, here, in this case, we have statement with nine and uh, uh, species with nine and six statement into the genus Aniva, but they came into different clades. So that shows that, or that suggests, or that proof, in some way, prove it, that Aniva is no uh, monophyletic. Let's look at another example with the genus Lycaria, a genus that honestly I always thought it was monophyletic because. It's the only one with all the species had three statements. And then <laughs> we found the species in three different independent clades. So like Claria is no monophyletic uh, neither. So number of statements doesn't contribute 
to uh, define monophyletic genera. So we look at the number of uh, loci, locules, I'm sorry, locules. Um, and then we look between two and four, not shape, not shape organization, not the num only numbers. And then that one is even messier than the number of statements with uh, transition from four here in, in uh, the empty or the white circles to two in the green circle. And that happened also in three uh, independent events. But because nowadays in this nice family, sometimes we have transition from four to two, so white to green, you know, but they were back to one, to white. So they are four to two to four. So what that means, that this character is really plastic. And, then, and again, this character doesn't help us to define a monophyletic genera. Then the last character that we look is the breeding system. That one is a little bit more consistent with all the Dicea species in one clade and the Gynolaecia species. And Gynolaecia species for us in this moment are species that are described as Dicea with a swollen pistil in the male flower. So that's what we score as Gynolaecia for this, uh, for this analysis. And then we found that Gynolaecia evolved independently from Dicea. You know, and it evolved twice. We have these species here. There is an independent origin of this. And again, breeding system didn't help uh, help us uh, defining monophyletic genera. Even with the Dicea species, we have species from three different uh, genera here. So no Coteas, Roste, Monorabne, and Endicleria. So the result of this is some floral taxonomy floral taxonomical character evolve multiple independent times. And then in supracotea, those characters do not contribute to the living monophyletic genera. They don't contribute in, uh, individually or neither when you put them together, no any combination of them. So that is a really neat result. Then I start digging a little bit into the systematic. So we have this mess, we have these floral characters and the work. So it's like a why we don't look for unexplored morphological characters. And then for that, I decided to explore epidermal leaf characters to see if we can find or they can support monophyly. So this is a kind of, a, it's not an easy slide. So let me walk you through. Mm -hmm. So we use uh, Ayuvia in this, uh, for this uh, example. Ayuvia is not a monophyletic genus uh, with species in at least two different clades, but, had, but recent taxonomical changes has proposed moving species between different groups trying to, to, uh, trying to define a monophyletic Ayuvia, but they haven't been able to do it. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is not us, this is, uh, I didn't cite this one, it's, it's uh, the uh, Dr. Lower, James Lowen in Hamburg uh, University lab. So what they did is in the Ayuvia, they include or they transferred all the species of Cinnamomon and Mucinodamne into Ayuvia. All those species are in this clade and it's in red. You know? And then another uh, uh, taxonomical changes that they propose is they transfer three species from Ayuvia to Dambornegia, Dambornegia, and then when we look at the phylogeny, we have some species of Ayuvia, plus Cinnamomum, plus Mosinodamne here, and then some species that are still Ayuvia into this oil clade related uh, with the species of the Ocostea insularis group. Ocostea insularis group is an informal name, informal name. So still with all this transfer, Ayuvia is non-monophyletic with the species of Ayuvia here and here. So in two different clades. So what happened now is when you, if we accept those changes, we have in each of these clades, we have a species with two and four uh, uh, lo locules. Before using regular taxonomy, or we don't accept those changes, we still can uh, delimit Ayuvia from Mosinodarne and from the other genera just using our statements, the number of statements. However, we don't have a monophyletic group when we use uh, this approach. So what we did here, we explored the epidermal leaf character. The epidermis is kind of the skin of the leaf. 
here we have it. This is an upside down leaf, just this layer at the top, of the leaf. And then we look uh, a stomata morphology on this thing. So those are the stomata. The stomata are these pores in the leaf that they open and close, and they allow the gas exchange for photosynthesis in the, uh, on the leaf. So what we ask is if, if uh, looking at these epidermal leaf characters, you know, can support monophyletic genera in supra or cotea. So what we found is an species of Ayuvia and cinnamomum, all of them has this kind of big, thick cuticle rim around the stomata. In all the species we have seen that, except for one species, uh, it's uh, Ayuvia montana or Cinnamomum triplinerbe. Uh, you know, tropical botanists will find that name really familiar. Cinnamomum triplinerbe is everywhere. 90% uh, is misidentified, but the 10% is, yeah, it's everywhere. It's not really widespread species that doesn't have the same, uh, the same uh, stomatal rim, but molecular data support the position into this clade. So, yeah, we have some variation, but still this character is pretty distinct. The second group that includes the species of Ayuvia plus the Ocote insularis. So far in all the species that we have looked at, all of them has this kind of ornamentation around the stomata, but they don't have the big rim that you see in the other species. And then the third group is the species of uh, Dambornegia plus the three species that they uh, that have been transferred recently to uh, Dumbornegia. What we see here is that they have the same uh, stomata morphology. Still, on this case, we have species with two locules and four locules, um, preventing us to have like a taxonomical character or a character that allows to delimit this genera, even when the cuticle supports uh, these kind of uh, monophyletic groups, or that we can find other characters that support these monophyletic groups. So, so far, this again, this is also a, a work in progress. Uh, we can see that epidermal leaf character, especially stomata morphology, are phylogenetically conserved. Again, that means related species, blood related species, have a similar morphology and they differ for no uh, blood related species. So I hope I can walk you like why we have all this problem between a uh, monophyletic group that we can define pretty well, but this kind of limitation to have a taxonomy using the, the regular uh, information that we have can also match this monophyletic group. In some way, so far we cannot have both. We cannot have monophyletic group and a clear uh, taxonomy or easy to use taxonomy. So what can we do? So one approach that we, uh, what, that we are using in nowadays now is using the International Code of Phylogenetic Nomenclature in Supracotea. So what is this uh, phylocode? So phylocode is just a, it is a formal set of rules for phylogenetic definitions intended to name clades. So we are naming clade. We are not naming family, genus, species, nothing related with the, with the uh, Linnaean system. And that, this phylocode system gives you some uh, freedom to name things without having to find morphological characters. It's a really neat tool. Uh, it's not intended to replace uh, the uh, linear taxonomy, the hierarchical uh, taxonomy. However, in in perfect scenarios when monophyletic groups, when genus are monophyletic, you know, they can be combined. So we can name the same clade and correspond to the genus. So they are complementary systems. System. So what we did is uh, uh, looking at the phylogeny that we uh, that we uh, that we built. Built. So we will look at this. We have, for instance, some limitations. Still, some limitations. So Ocotea, the genus Ocotea, how is this uh, delimited today? It includes around 450 species, but we only include 53 species in the phylogeny. You know, and those 53 species 
they are in seven unrelated clades. So this genus of code is not monophyletic. Everybody knew that before, but I wasn't expecting it to be so polyphyletic. So it's all over the place. Place. If we decide to name Okotea, we have to go to the type specimen. And the type of specimen is a Daisy specimen, is the Okotea guianensis, that is in this clay. So an easy uh, choice would be everything that is Daisy in Okotea, it's, it's, it's remains at Okotea, and the other species you know, goes away to different gen genera or to create a new genera. However, again, we only know the position of 50 species out of 450. So we don't know anything about the genus. We don't know if the other 400 species are gonna be included in these seven clades or we are gonna get more clades. So it's no, it's no recommended to uh, define Okotea under the linear system. And still, if we think about Daisia species becoming Okotea, we still have another group of Okotea that is not related. It's kind of related, but it's not sister to this Okotea. So even the most basic character of being Daisy doesn't contribute to separate this gender. So that's part of the mess. Everything is polyphyletic. Everything is mixed with everything, and we don't know, uh, we don't have enough characters. However, with this phylogeny, we can pro propose, or we propose seven definitions for uh, seven clades that we have here. I will give you some examples. The first one is supraocotea, that when placed the use of uh, ocotea complex, and it's an informal group. Now we have a formal group. And I say before, include 950 species and 17 genera. You know, here, uh, this is what uh, supraocotea represents. It doesn't include Ayuvia and Persea. Those are uh, outside this, uh, this group. A good example is on, uh, using the final code, you can use other uh, character like distribution. For instance, this case, we have Palaeocotea that include all the species of Supracotea that occurs in the old world. So the species that are not in the neotropics. Uh, this phylogeny and other uh, phylogenies uh, with Sanger, uh, uh, Sanger approach they had found that all the species from the old world always came together into the same clade. So it's really likely that all the species will be in this, uh, all the old world species of Okotea will be placed on this, uh, this clade. Another example using this distribution is Mesocotea. Mesocotea include two groups, uh, the genus Zambornesia and the Okotea Elicterifolia group. Or uh, again, as this is an informal group. These species are distributed mostly in Central America, in Mesoamerica. And some few species can make it to South America, Colombia, maybe Ecuador, probably Venezuela, but they are not uh, distributed in all South America. So this is a Mesoamerican group. Interesting is that the three species of Ayuvia that now are proposed to be included in Dambornegia, they were the northern distribution of Ayuvia. Ayuvia is mostly South America with some few species into the Central America and, the, and I think and some in the Caribbean, maybe not in the Caribbean. Uh, but those three species are uh, in the south of Mexico. They were like an outlier within Ayuvia. So included in the Bornella, we also have some uh, morphological characters like the uh, cuticle, but also the distribution. So it makes sense moving those species here, but again, we don't have taxonomical uh, characters to define this, but we can use Mesocotea and include all the species of Dambornegia and species of uh, Cotea elicterifolia. And another example is also with the Daisia species. So we have this clade called Diocotea that include all the Daisia species that originate independently for Pluriocotea. That means, that definition means and we can have some Daisia species here. This clade, the Pluriocotea, is the one that contains some of the Gynodaisia species. So we are anticipating that maybe some of those Gynodaisia are really Daisia species. However, you know, 
Those are included in Plurio Cotea, and they, they will have some other morphological character like the pistil, the swollen pistil, and differ from this Diocotea. But this Diocotea included species from the Diocotea telabdaisi in the Clarion Rostemo Norabne, and the species of the Ocotea Cernua group. So it doesn't matter that Ocotea is not monophyletic, using Diocotea or Diocotea. Uh, I never said diocotea. Okay, diocotea. <laughs> uh, using diocotea, we will uh, uh, we will be talking about all the dioecia species on uh, supracotea. So to finish with, so the conclusion that like I know I see, of course, in supracotea, there's a really interesting funding, uh, a lot of uh, opportunity to study uh, uh, reproductive biology on these uh, tropical plants. Some traits like, like fruit shape is not entirely phylogenetically conserved. Uh, so we can use phylogenies, but we don't need to care that much. Or we don't have to care always about uh, the taxonomical groups. We can use uh, the regular taxonomy for that. It won't affect those analyses. Uh, flora character have evolved multiple and independent times. What is uh, one of the main reasons why we have this uh, taxonomical nightmare. And alternative morphological characters, and in this case, the leaf uh, uh, epidermal uh, characters can help us to define monophyletic groups. Uh, but with the current information, we uh, propose to use the final code. And we note that the final code and the taxonomy are still really far to converge. But use, uh, I think, or I hope, and using this uh, integrated approach you know, pulling information from the ecology, from the evolution, from the systematic, sometime in the next 200 years, we'll be able to generate a nice key that will give us all this easy to define and to find monophyletic uh, genera in Laudes. So with that, so I want to acknowledge all the institutions that has contributed in some uh, moment of these uh, projects. Uh, I want to thank my uh, my hosts here at the New York Botanical Garden, Fabian Michelangeli, who has been an amazing host here. Uh, and Liza Comira and Cyborg Quizboard Lab, they were my former advisors at the end. Dr. Michael Donoghue, who also has contributed uh, on this, uh, on this uh, development of this phylocode and phylogeny. And uh, I want to acknowledge uh, uh, all the help from De Dr. Hank Vanderwehr. Hank, uh, Dr. Vanderwehr uh, is at the Missouri Botanical Garden and he's uh, the taxonomist of Laudes. And he used uh, alpha taxonomy, so the linear taxonomy, but he's the only person who I can say can understand Laudes and has understand Laudacy in the last 200 years. No one like him. When you go and read his paper, he still use a uh, uh, linear system to define groups. But when you go and read the description, he's always trying to pull these groups. And in many cases, they are these clays that we have been finding. So it's really interesting the way how he can use this, but also point to these groups so for in the future, someone can take out that information and again, help with the taxonomy. So with that, so I want to thank you for being here again. And I think that I'm open for questions. Thank you so much, Juan. That was really interesting. Yeah. Um, this is very cool. I, I certainly have my own set of questions, but I want to remind everybody yeah. that, uh, that if you all have questions, uh, please write them in the chat and, and I'll read them off. Uh, and then we can get your questions answered. Um, you can write them publicly or privately, however you want to do it. If you write them in the chat, I will read them out loud. Um, I, I guess while we wait, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll get, get started here. Hold on just one second while I... Uh, uh, there we go. Okay. Uh, okay. So, so I... I First off, this was super cool, and uh, and I, I I was immediately first thinking about the um, the ecology section or, or 
yeah, the ecology, I think it was the ecology section here, um, talking about, about the uh, uh, development of, of, of elongated fruits um, and how this is like, you know, targeting specific uh, disperser species. Uh, and I was wondering, because I thought that was, that was very interesting, um, you know, moving towards that, that, that hypothesis, giving like additional support to that hypothesis. But I was wondering if there was any additional support from like the other side of, of this, uh, this like relationship where if, if anybody has been looking at, to your knowledge, uh, like a bird selection on, on specific fruits favoring uh, elongated fruits versus like, like spherical fruits. Yeah, no, no, that's one of the limitations that we have with this project. We don't have, uh, or for my knowledge, we don't have information of uh, fruit jewels, uh, specifically, uh, information related with uh, eating nowadays. So the hypothesis of uh, Dr. Susan Mason is like uh, you get elongated in Costa Rica, the, uh, I'm not plant guy, I don't remember the birds, uh, the green bird that we have there, I'm sorry for people who like birds, the green bird <laughs> and the other one who was not green. Uh, those are like a really iconic uh, and common species in Costa Rica. They, people spot them eating uh, the fruit uh, quite often. However, outside Costa Rica, we don't have information. We don't know who eat them. I have seen two kinds eating uh, laudacy fruit. I see one that is uh, powers, but that's it. There are no uh, clear information from this. Mm. And then, so that made it uh, to expand the, the, the hypothesis. However, uh, we also have to think about the type of forest. That's why we put climatic information. So we were trying to, you know, go around. We don't have information from birds, but in some way we can look at elevation, precipitation, and temperature as a proxy to see who lives there, or maybe fruit size is related to kind of forest. So you are in a tropical forest, maybe with a high canopy, you need bigger seeds, you know. And then in those kind of ecosystems, you also have more uh, uh, kind of bigger birds. So in some way, we are using this climatic uh, information to overcome, to kind of go around the lack of information in, in, in the, with birds. Completely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I also imagine there's probably like, you know, for the dedicated ornithologist, maybe there's the, uh, the sort of experimental approach where perhaps you could take like, you know, different species, it looked like from your, from your phylogeny that there were closely related species that had, that had, uh, like more spherical and then more elongated seeds. So you could like perhaps control for uh, um, like phylogenetic distance issues by taking like closely related species with different fruit sizes, different fruit shapes and like doing a sort of like uh, choice experiment with birds. That could be interesting. I think that could be interesting. Yeah, yeah. Another limitation is like uh, most of the time we see that they're eating a laudacy or we don't know the species. So oftentimes people say like, oh, they were eating a laudacy. So that doesn't help mm. to know which species it is. So we cannot connect that information with uh, the fruits and the fruit you Makes it, makes it yeah. very challenging. Yeah. An additional challenge to studying this, this, this large group. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have a few questions here. So first, uh, uh, thank you very much for the for the nice presentation. Are there molecular and genetic data about flower and fruit development for the different species? Sorry, sorry. What was that? Uh, the question was: uh, Are there molecular and genetic data for about fruit and flower development for the different species? Oh. Uh... Not to my knowledge. I don't know anyone uh, working in development for this in Uh Something that I would like to push uh, to invite people uh, to work. And there's not like any, I don't know any information, probably in avocado, but not in this uh, supracotea plate. Avocado is really far away, but not to my knowledge of that. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
Great talk, Juan. Thank you. Uh, so what will, what will be your advice for a student slash botanist uh, that wants to study the systematics and taxonomy of one of these clades? Where to start? That's a really nice question. Um, it starts with something that we know that is uh, not monophyletic. And then it like a, so one of the problems that we have, one of the limitations, so we only know the position of 150 species. And we're always trying to work with the, with the whole complex, with all Suplocotea. We're trying to plug all these species. And I think that the best approach will be to work with these groups that we know that are informal groups, and that are non-monophyletic genera, and start getting more information from those species. So like Caria, you know, I, I wish someone is working in like Caria. It's a really easy. OK, I won't say the word easy here, because it's loud easy. But it's a, there's, there's a lot of information about like Caria, you know. But the fact that, it's, that now we know that it's polyphyletic, you know, that opened a lot of doors to study ecology, to study systematic, and to start generating this, uh, naming these groups, you know, instead of just going to the big group that is Ocotea, that we still need a lot of work on it. And Naiva, for instance, there are a lot of small groups that are gonna be uh, uh, easy to work with. So I would recommend it to start with this small clade, start like defining this small clade and things like that. For instance, in hopefully, then by the end of this year, one of those clades that we found uh, with this phylogeny uh, is going to be a, a new genus. We have, uh, or Dr. Van der Waal is working on that. So we are start getting, we are start doing some progress, but instead of working in large scale, we are, like I said, uh, working in small scale. So that would be like my advice for, uh, for, for botanists and systematics. That sounds like good advice. And starting, starting yeah. sort of small and narrow focused. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have more questions. Juan, congrats. Uh, so, uh, so proud of you. Uh, can you talk a bit about your methods? Uh, molecular markers used support values? Yeah, okay, so the methods. So yeah, I want, I want all the technicality in this talk, but uh, what we did is, so when I started, the, when I started this project, I tried to use a uh, Sanger uh, method. So we use uh, ITS, RBCN, PBSPA, and all the markers that have been used in nowadays, but we were not getting any support. We were like kind of just getting the same support than all the other phylogenies, no matter what we did, increasing the number of species. So we uh, took a phylogenomic approach. We use a uh, rat -seek. So for that sake, it's like uh, this kind of random uh, fragments from the genome. And then we are lining uh, using the avocado uh, uh, genome. And then uh, that's definitely what we did. We just use that sick. Uh, good and bad part of that sick is that I, we don't have, we didn't build the libraries. We just extract the DNA and we send it to Florogenics. And then we got the sequence. So I cannot tell you exactly with enzymes, uh, calling enzyme they use, but we use uh, fragments for, uh, I think that was 150 uh, bases. And we recovered, uh, even we recovered a good sequence for about four to six herbarium specimens. So we can even use uh, a rat seek with herbarium specimens. Uh, the support we got, uh, most of the clays had a uh, uh, 100% support. Something that is tricky when you use rat seek is like the p-value. P-value is really useful when you have like a kind of small or middle-sized samples. But when you get a lot of samples, the p-value lose uh, power. The same, I think, can happen with this uh, support for rat seek. Most of the clays has a uh, 100% support, but I still doubt that that's uh, what we have because we have a really scattered uh, phylogeny. However, we use concatenated analysis where we put all the fragments together, we align them together, and we use coalescent approach as well, where we get one snip in each of these uh, loci. And both uh, phylogenies, they uh, give the same topology, just few uh, uh, disagreement on the tips. And the last thing that we did is we use uh, so one of the problems with that 
seek is not uploading, it's a limitation. It's that we get a lot of uh, missing data because we cannot control with uh, no side to recover. So the way uh, to do it is like, uh, there's a way to restrict for uh, for uh, missing data. And we use uh, like a 10, 20, 40, and 50% of the species uh, with missing data. And again, in all the scenarios, we recover the same topology. So even when the, the bootstrap support is almost 100% in most of the cases, we try to uh, look for different ways to just verify that those numbers were real. So I believe that this is a really well supported phylogeny. Yeah. That's awesome. I this was a that was very cool uh, sort of example of how you know I don't know switching data types, switching the the tools that you're using you know really improves the the resolution yeah. that you're looking at and yeah. what you're describing about about the issues with Sanger sequencing and the resolution compared to jumping to something with just more like sheer orders of magnitude more data. Um, yeah. like rad seek it's you know a, a story that continues to be told <laughs> over yeah and over. yeah yeah hopefully it's become cheaper yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> absolutely um has the type species of okotea been included in the phylogenetic analysis uh no we were not able to get dna for uh this uh okotea guianensis that is the type specimen However, uh, using a uh, Sanger sequence, uh, Dr. Uh, James Rowell in Germany, they have been able to extract that. And uh, the species uh, is nested within the Dicea species of uh, Okotea. So we know the position coming from uh, Sanger, but we were not able to extract DNA. Like again, nowadays is a little bit tricky. Uh, it took me around three years to get the protocol for extracting DNA out of Laudense. And a lot of people contribute, uh, Alejandra Vasco, I think that was the main contribution on this. I was using Bepta, Mepto, Capto, Etanol, or whatever you pronounce that name. And I was using this really small amount and Alejandra said like, no, just put more. And then I started adding, adding, and adding, and then it started working. But it took like around three years. And many species we were not able to get DNA out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have another question for you. Uh, yeah. So I also found it very interesting that the uh, in in some species you you observed that there was a, a loss, a reoccurring loss of of stamens, dropping from nine to three or nine to six, never really going the other way. Uh, like the that that the sort of uh, uh, ancestral state is the nine the nine stamen state, uh, yeah. and so species are only losing, not gaining. Um, I, I found that very interesting, and I wanted to ask you what your thoughts on that. If there are some situations or some some selective advantage for uh, for a species losing stamens, having fewer stamens uh, than than nine, I guess. Yeah. So. Not that many species has uh, has this reduction. You know, there's not that many events when you get from nine to six or nine to three. So I, I cannot tell you what is the advantage of that. Or uh, maybe I don't think that it's just an advantage, something that just maybe happen. Mm -hmm. uh, what is interesting is the way how they 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 lose the statements. So some of the species lose the six outer stamens. Remember, this is a three minute flower. So you get uh, everything's in multiple of three. You get three stamens in the center and six outside. So what happens most of the time, you lose the six that are outside. So you get, you get three stamens or you lose the three that are in uh, the inner stamens and then you get the six outside. So I don't know if that's an advantage for like uh, maybe pollinators can access the pollen easily. No, but I think that it's like a kind of a different genes controlling the number of statements or different genes controlling the inner statements and the outer statements. And for some reason, they get a mutation and then just, you know, remains like that. But I don't know, I cannot think about any advantage. Right. Also, the species occurs in different ecosystems. So I don't know what will be the reproductive advantage of that. Yeah, 
Okay. I was just, you know, a point of curiosity, really. It's certain, yeah. obviously it's certainly possible for a, uh, a trait like that to arise and become fixed in a population without it being actually advantageous. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that's totally something that could have happened as well. I was just curious if you had any yeah. insights. So I'm, I'm not, I'm a lichenologist, so I'm, it's an area, yeah. <laughs> not an area of my, of, of my expertise. You know, yeah, so. lichens and nowadays it's almost the same, but let's start with air, <laughs> <no>? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. Um, okay, well, it looks like our, our question pool has, has mostly dried up. Uh, so I think that we're going to, we're going to call it today and let our, our speaker go off and probably get some food or uh, yeah. take a break, do whatever you got to do. Uh, so thank you everybody for stopping by. We are certainly seeing some nice comments uh, trickling in here, uh, some, some thank yous. Uh, thank you everybody for taking part in this uh, in this Tory talk uh, for April. I, I, I very much uh, am happy to see all of you here. Um, so please stay tuned for uh, for our next talk in May. More details will be provided to you guys through the usual means uh, by email to members and by uh, and by posts on our social media accounts as well. Uh, so so please, Stay tuned. I'm going to post these social media links here again, just so that everybody sees them if you haven't already. Um, so otherwise, I hope everybody has a great night. Take care, everybody. So thank you. Bye, everyone.